Hello and welcome to Dinish Guarda YouTube podcast series. Right now, uh, and of course, since the beginning, powered by citiesabc.com and openbusinesscouncil.org. Once again, we're here to profile global leaders and experts and personalities that are shaping the world and creating narratives that actually can take us, I would say, to a more positive environment, but as well, understanding some of the biggest, uh, I would say, dilemmas that we're facing as humanity, as society, as people, and as uh, business people and technology people as well. Um, today, I want to welcome uh, to our series, Tommaso Di Bartolo, uh, that is a serial entrepreneur, startup investor, author, and advisor to some of the Silicon Valley most renowned startup accelerators, such as Google Launchpad, Draper University, and Alchemist. And as well, we're going to be talking about his last book that he wrote uh, uh, in parallel with uh, Cathy Ackle, Dirk Lueve, um, and edited by John Arkontaki, that is Navigating the Metaverse, a guide to li limitless poss possibilities in the Web 3.0 world. Um, so Tomaso is an out-of-the-box personality uh, that has a fantastic achievement CV that includes a master in electronic marketing from Bavarian Academy for Advertisement and Marketing, and as well has been involved from an entrepreneur part in creating startups from scratch with two exits under his belt, and has been as well working with the high profile organizations worldwide and uh, being as well a uh, member of the Metaverse Business Council at Forbes Business Council and founder chairman of, of Alma Meta. His CV is quite extensive, but I think one of the areas that is particularly important is the, the profile as a faculty member at the UCL Berkeley, the University of Berkeley, um, running a class on entrepreneurship and serves the role of guest lecturer as well at uh, Stanford University. And uh, I think, of course, today, bear in mind that we are in the time of metaverse, we're going to be highlighting his expertise in digital in, turn, in all the areas of 360 of Web 3.0, and especially the metaverse, and everything related with metaverse from NFTs to different areas. So Tomaso serves as well as a professor at Everywhere Realm Inc. Um, he was there during 2022, and is also the founding board member of Silicon Valley, an institute that helps future-proof traditional corporations by applying transformative innovation systematically. Based in Silicon Valley, of course, the mecca of technology worldwide. Tomaso is as well a prolific um, writer and author uh, that speaks seven languages and has been working in multiple books and uh, uh, a lot of papers and research. Some of these books, besides the Navigating the Metaverse, includes How to Grow Fact Your Startup, Create Traction Methodology. And as well, last but not least, he has a, an important role as a philanthropist as the share of the Protein X Foundation, a nonprofit organization fostering next gen proteins and sustainable packaging, which I think is a very important thing for our times. So, welcome to our series, Tomaso. Uh, there's much more I could be reading about your profile, but I think I always like to start with a small summary. Much appreciated. Thank you. The pleasure is all mine, Dennis. So I want to start, um, um, and I know that we have around uh, 50 minutes, so I'll go as fast. So in terms of your background, so um, let's start by the basis. So you you have been doing a lot of things. So a bit of your personal background and then a bit of the personal and academic. Yeah, so I'm uh, I'm based here out of uh, the Silicon Valley Bay Area for the last 12 years. Uh, but I'm originally actually from, from Europe, from South Europe, actually. I'm from Sicily, from Italy, Sicily. I graduated in Germany where I lived 20 plus years. And uh, I went through London for about a year, and then uh, um, I, uh, you know, life took me to the Silicon Valley uh, Bay Area. And the reason why I moved to the Bay Area because I started in tech in 1998, uh, so early days. Uh, started my first company in the year 2000s. Fast forwarded, as you mentioned, I had a couple of uh, startups that I started from scratch. I did not join them, but started from scratch as an entrepreneur, so founder and, and CEO of uh, um, four startups, three in the cloud computing business to a time when cloud computing was still, you know, uh, early and emerging, right? And the most, uh, and then the last one, uh, six years ago, uh, was a, a, a mobile app, which by the way, takes me to 
another chapter which I'm more than happy to explore also after six years I'm starting uh, and uh, being announced by the end of the year my fifth startup which is a startup in the metaverse as you guys might eventually uh, be guessing based on my profile I'm a two times author uh, the most recent book as you mentioned navigating the metaverse um, or focused on the metaverse contribute on Forbes on the metaverse topics right and um and I'm a couple of part of a couple of startups uh, advisory boards uh, where I guide the the founders to you know to uh, to grow their businesses. All of them uh, focused on Web three and and the metaverse themselves. That's in a nutshell, um, you know, about a bit about the ge geographical Tomaso and a bit about the the business background of Tomaso. So uh, having family in Sicily, I cannot uh, uh, stop by, by asking. So. From Sicily to Silicon Valley is a long distance, but as well, Sicily is, is actually one ancestral millionaire um, community and as well Highland that has so much history and so much layers. So yes. I would like to ask, so someone that, and I respect a lot, someone that came from Sicily and that's actually the top of the world on Silicon Valley. So what would be this kind of, uh, first, uh, the things that made you be the person you are from probably family background and different parts or even personalities that you that influenced you so um i love i love the nuances that you are bringing in because uh, you know being from certain regions and certain worlds um gives you either easier access or more challenging access right and definitely in europe for those who know europe or south europe in general right is not the rich europe right it's more the challenging europe it's the europe where you go for vacation we love the food throughout you know portugal spain greece turkey italy right but it's not necessarily a very simple way of 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 uh upcoming or it's not really a catapult into the world right but the strength what we get uh, in these locations is really the fighter mentality right and i love also to be associated with the fact of you know immigrant being an immigrant becomes an advantage because immigrants meaning that you decide proactively to be always out of your comfort zone and be very fast to learn uh, practices uh, that in this new environment that you join once you embrace the fact that you can uh, be outperforming whomever is very cozy in the land that he was born and raised right you 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 really you really can run fast and learn fast right and then humbly obviously once you learn fast you can give back to the community that's actually kind of my mentality and my mindset i make my i made my weaknesses my strength i understood early on you know moving from sicily to germany already which is a totally different culture different obviously language different political uh, situations right that uh, that uh, in order for you to succeed you cannot uh, just uh, do but you need to over uh, excel right and this is in my day and in my dna my dna it's always wherever i go and whatever i do i want to over excel beyond what the average are doing i say there is no space actually right now for great people there is no space for great people why because there are a bunch of great people in order for you to be on top today you need to be extraordinary fast smart and agile right so and that's uh, that's kind of my my dna right to wrap up this uh, question of yours i have a sentence that uh, that uh, i've been able to craft a, a, a quote that i've been able to craft over the last 22 years of of an entrepreneur which which goes like this never forget where you come from it keeps you humble, but where you come from cannot limit you where you want to go. And what I mean with that is your origin or your comfort zone. It doesn't mean your origin, your geographic, where you are from, but even your comfort zone, right? Where, 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 where are you right now, right? Because many people, regardless, regardless if immigrant or not immigrant, right, they are in a comfort zone, right? They have fears to move ahead, right? And if you, if you look back where you stand, right, you say, well, this is where I stand. This is where I am right now. And if you don't project yourself into the future, you will be not moving. You will be not executing. You will be not learning and therefore you will be not actually experimenting life to your full excess what we should all do because we only have one life i i completely subscribe and it's actually i as well feel the same especially coming as well like you said from a southeastern country myself for europe um so i want to touch so how did you start being an entrepreneur and i think in your case is you are a kind of something i i kind of relate to because you are a serial entrepreneur you are an advisor and you are an author. 
So it's three things that are, and then academic, actually, you have the fourth layers. So it's, it's quite complex. And normally, most of the people get broken between the four, or at least can mostly one or two, they can do it. But when it is four, it's quite complex, especially being an entrepreneur. It's very, very demanding, which I respect to all entrepreneurs in the world. So how do you cope with this four? And as well, I've been um, building this, these different personalities. I think, Dennis, you don't aim to achieve responsibility. You mature into responsibilities. It's a bit different, right? It's not that you, you know, being an entrepreneur is not that you go to another university, right? That you say, hey, I want to study entrepreneurship. Well, in all, in all honesty, you can even study today entrepreneurship, right? Because I'm at UC Berkeley. It's exactly what I teach. I teach entrepreneurship. Um, based on, on on different topics, like with an angle of specific industry, which right now is Web3 and the metaverse, right? But to, this is not an, uh, an, 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 a, a, a certificate that you can embrace, right? It's, it's something that happens within you, right? It's something that you start out. And, you know, to me, there are there is kind of a, a pathway to entrepreneurship. So first of all, you always need to keep yourself very curious, right? Uh, about anything. You can be anything that you want. The only thing that you need to have is curiosity towards whatever is problem solving. So curiosity makes you move. Curiosity uh, makes the human being move in a direction, which is usually execution. Once you execute, you as a result have learnings. And learnings is what benefits us and our mind and our soul the most because we on earth, what we want is grow. Everybody wants to grow, right? And it's not just growing the bank account, but it's us as a human being growing. Once you start growing, you start understanding about yourself, Dennis. What is your talent? These are the first step. Curiosity leads to execution. Execution leads to learning and leads to understanding of your talent. Once you start understanding your talent, then you know exactly how to use yourself how to allocate you as a human being towards something that you are performing so this is when you get into the entrepreneurial realm right and once you are an entrepreneur meaning you're focused really on solving problems right then then you do one of the, uh, one of the, the others right because once you once you are hit with a with a challenge that you recognize right and this curiosity drives you to execute right then you cannot stop right just because the the problem that you face is so strong that you want to solve it that you see how you can solve it right so the entrepreneur has this big talent that has a huge vision there is a difference between sight and vision, right? Side is when you take a lamp and you point in front of your feet, right? And, and you see the next step that you are doing. 99.9% .9 have sight of the people, right? All the executives on earth have sight. They don't have a vision. That's the reason why corporations or even startups, they're failing because there is a, a lacking vision. Vision is what? Vision is when you catapult three, four step ahead and you can see something that others are not seeing a new behavior, a new need, a new, a new uh, uh, technology that you would use in a way that solves the human being and it helps the human being doing something faster, better, and cheaper, right? And then you would need to have the ability as an entrepreneur to slice this vision down and to say, how do I start today? Well, that's the big picture, but how do I start today, right? And by doing these activities, Dennis, people start inviting you. Like I was humbled that UC Berkeley invited me a couple of years, right? And, and, and contribute uh, uh, to uh, the academics, right? And, and, and be part of the uh, uh, ecosystem of UC Berkeley ecosystem, which I enjoy and, 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 and genuinely uh, uh, really love because I learned the most there, Dennis, right? People say you're lecturing there, but I learn actually there with the students, right? They, they, they share with us what the future is. You guide them with more, with more of, of a wisdom, right? Then, you know, you start investing in startup and you start being a more, uh, part of other startups. That's how you get into the investor, right? And then, uh, uh, and then uh, sooner or later, at least this is what happened to me a couple of years ago. I started writing. Right? Where you ask me, you know, author, right? Uh, I like to say that the pen is the psychologist of uh, the writer. You know, people that are accelerated, that like to experience life to a maximum, we never pause, right? For us, it's always doing, doing, doing. But when you force yourself to write, you start actually reflecting. Uh, from a present perspective, uh, perspective backwards, and you start for the very first time assessing what you really did, right? Because this is what writing forces you, right? 
And so, yeah, I've been writing two, two books and that's how I got to, I hope I responded kind of, then to your question, how do I got to my, to my hats? <laughs> no, it's very good response and very inspiring. And I agree completely with you. This is about learning with each other and the continuous curiosity because it's not an easy task, but as well as part of the fun. So let's go right now to your work. So you have uh, an experience as an entrepreneur and you have some exits and congratulations for that. And you have as well being an advisor, some big organizations. So we have uh, from Silicon Valley's uh, most renowned actually organizations from Google Launchpad to Draper University, which I'm a huge fan as well, and to the Alchemist. So among other, other organizations. So how did you shift this part of academic author and now as well advising some of these organizations and as well how you do and you, you coordinate this work? Um, I think it, it's really very much tied into the previous line of reasoning. Um, you are, you use the word shifting. It's not, the, it's not that you do something uh, exclusively or you dedicate, you, you start allocating your time to things that you, that you understand that you can add value to, right? So for instance, um, uh, supporting the entrepreneurial ecosystem is something that, uh, for us, especially here in the Bay Area, Silicon Valley Bay Area, is uh, is part of the DNA, right? So we love meeting with uh, other entrepreneurs, with upcoming entrepreneurs, because it's a, it's a beautiful exchange in this, right? So every entrepreneur is in a different stage, is in a different, uh, uh, in a different, uh, with different problems. But ultimately, what we all share is really this urge to to make a change, to make a dent in the world for a better world, right? And so when you be part, when you are part of, you know, the Draper University, the Google Launchpad, right? Uh, which, by the way, started a couple of years ago. Right now, I um, unfortunately cannot dedicate too much of that time. But, you know, you try to, to always help um, an entrepreneur. The way that I like to handle my calendar, if I break it down, um, I, I usually reserve a Fridays. Um, you know, one or two conversations with uh, with entrepreneurs, right? That I can be of any help. So I make it really a mission to be always of specifically to either a company or to a human being um, of 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 help. That's what's that's what brings me joy. And the reason for that is, and I want to just pause a second because this is very important. What I really feel when you live, when you live your life you are almost writing your own book, which is your li called life. Now, if you write your own book called write, uh, life, and what I mean with that is that not, not in a literal way you, you are, you're sitting and typing your book, but I'm saying we all have a history. We all have experience. If you have these experiences and you don't share those with others, <laughs> why do you have those experiences, right? Why are you selfish just keeping them for yourself, right? My purpose is to experience life, to take what life gives you, the maximum learning, and then share it with others and make it available to others, right? In form of mentoring, in form of courses, in terms of academia, in forms of investments, right? And so I like to say that I share, you know, my time, my talent, and my testimony, which means really what I learned, right? And my treasure, which is the investment. So these are my four T's. And I've written an article about that, right, to others so that, you know, I can leave a legacy, right? Because it's not about what you make on life. It's about what you live in, uh, leave behind in life, right? Inspiring. And uh, and I think it's, it's as well what made me create this podcast. So thank you so much. About the book Navigating the Metaverse. Um, I know that is recent and the uh, metaverse is right now uh, a crossroad of multiple definitions, multiple questions. So I know that the book for people listening to us, I suggest really, and I'm going to be highlighting the book in my books, ABC. Um, and I think one of the things, so this is a book between three as well, I personalities from Katie, Arkel, Dirk, Luev, and you. But uh, in the book highlights the guide to the limitless, limitless possibilities in a web 3.0 world. So Let's go, I think, first of all, of course, I've been trying to highlight in this series, what is the metaverse, and this mystify all the nuances. You are as well an entrepreneur, and as well, like you just said, you are as well building metaverse technology and metaverse companies. So 
how did the book came and what's the messaging of the book? Let's start by top level. Yeah, the, the book came around because, you know, uh, my peers, you know, Kathy and Dirk, both involved early on, uh, like myself too, in the topic of, you know, blockchain and, and Web3 and the metaverse, right? We met a couple of times and we were kind of uh, overlapping with the one or the other projects working together, right? And and we all had definitely this one uh, commonality, which was, well, we, everybody's asking about this metaverse thing, right? And, and should we not share some, some, some insight? Like what, what is it that we have been asked, right? And so, so this is how the, the origin was, right? By the way, back in the time, uh, which, which is just a couple of uh, uh, years ago, this is the beginning of uh, 2001, right? The, the topic metaverse was actually not that uh, demanded. What was demanded way more was non-fungible tokens, right? So if you guys remember in the year 2000, we had roughly um, overall revenue on earth, half a half a billion in non-fungible tokens, which are also, you know, there are unique digital assets that you can own and they live on, on a new technology called the blockchain, right? And, and what you could do with this unique digital asset is that you for the very first time have a digital asset that it's yours, right? You can own it because you can own it, you can sell it, right? So it creates almost a new asset class that you can then use and leverage uh, to bring in into digital world. So in the year 2001, this asset class jumped from half a billion glo global revenues to roughly 20 to 25 billion glo globally, right? So it was a tremendous growth. 25 30x growth right if not more and uh, and uh, so the 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 turnaround or the the, the one of the key turnaround points was when when a, a, a very, very known entrepreneur, um, globally known entrepreneur called Mark Zuckerberg, the founder of of of, of uh, today Meta back then Facebook, right, uh, decided on October 2021 to not only reposition, right, um, the company that has the most uh, reach on earth measured right now in terms of user 3 billion right now, but, uh, but uh, also renamed the company, right? And that's when, when we saw that we are really on the right way to, to double click on the topic of, um, of, uh, of the metaverse, right? So, and that's how um, Dennis, the, the book came about, right? Had started with, let's share some, some know-how. Let's, let's share what we know, right? And then it became it became really a bestseller number one or number two, depending on which week you're looking at you know, right now in the topic of metaverse. Actually, globally, we're very very humbled, you know. Well, uh, congratulations first first of all, because it's really a topic that there's very few books first of all, and this is actually an area that there's a lot of myths. So let's start by one question that you guys answer quite well in the book, but uh, I want to start with a more broader one. So, um, so what is and what is not metaverse and and as well let's look at some myths and misconceptions of the concept of metaverse because at the moment like you mentioned you mentioned meta but i would say there's three iterations of metaverse that we have now and i want to provoke you a bit in a good way so we have one version that is the meta from facebook which is probably the most mainstream and it takes us a bit to the ready play one vr these big devices and so forth then there's a second version that is a bit like in the relationship with the NFTs, like the central and sandbox and all these platforms where we have actually kind of decentralized kind of uh, NFT or blockchain crypto enable um, gamification uh, metaverse inversive worlds. And then we have a third one, which is what I'm more excited that is actually really the continuation of web 2.0 to web 3.0 that is real solutions for the world. So how do you context in this and what is the, your vision on this? So first of all, it's interesting how, how you're looking at this and, and I'm really happy to slice down a couple of aspects that you mentioned. So let me start out with the, with the question, you know, uh, the mystifying what the metaverse is not, because I think that it's very valid uh, to have this exercise of what it's not because it gives us a better understanding of it, what potentially might be. Okay, so misconception number one, the metaverse is not a game. Gamers and crypto aficionados have been enjoying immersive world where they could play. Okay, that's different. So every 
innovation cycles has a so-called early adopter, right? If you should be reading maybe for those listeners who like these topics, right? Uh, uh, from from Jeffrey Moore crossing the chasm, right? Then you know how how a, a technology is being adopted. So early adoption has always early adopters, right? And the early adopters uh, as of the metaverse, or I actually should be saying as of games, that are built on blockchain, okay, have been gamers. Obviously, the gaming industry is a huge industry. It's a great industry, right? But again, it's number one, it's not a game, but gamers have been early adopters. Uh, position number two, I would say that definitely the metaverse is not NFTs. NFTs are a digital asset that lives, ideally, within an immersive world, and it has a purpose within the immersive world. You can buy NFTs on a marketplace, NFTs can become tokens that gives you access to other things, right? NFTs can be collectibles and art, that's what we are knowing, right? But the metaverse is not NFT. The metaverse has NFTs, and NFTs actually within the metaverse, and that's the beauty of it, have actually ideally utility within these uh, immersive world call, called the metaverse, right? So this is position number two, it's not NFTs. Position number two, three, metaverse is not a VR. The metaverse is uh, platform agnostic. Definitely it's web, it's mobile, it's VR, but, and this is very relevant to what I'm saying here, in order to achieve mass adoption, we need seamless integration into our real life. And in order to get seamless integration in our real life, we need to have it in our palm of our hands. And then to integrate it in our real life, it can only happen if we have augmented reality. Meaning we will be painting in the near future a layer of data, augmented reality, a reality data, into product, or onto products, places, and people, and purposes, right? That we can access through this augmented reality then and interconnect with the benefits of the Web3, right? So then obviously, you know, the next one is, and I hate to, to bust the dead one, but uh, uh, the, the metaverse is not meta. <laughs> like uh, Tesla is not the car, Google is not the internet, right? Meta is a company, right? That is uh, uh, known as, as a social network and now putting efforts to become an, uh, an immersive world. And they will be definitely having a chunk of an immersive world, right? But it's not metaverse right and last but not least and this is in my point of view almost uh, the tip of the iceberg right uh, metaverse is not a place metaverse is an experience metaverse is an experience as an extension to our real life that is what it's new the experience is connecting your physical world with your digital world and providing us the end user a new extended dimension that we have not had today i envision a world in which we with our mobile phones or maybe with our lenses or with our uh, eyeglasses will be having a layer of data of information through augmented reality without us going to a specific place we are no longer going to www Facebook, www, what not, right? In order for us to be in front of a desktop and access something centrally, we will be living our life the way that we have been doing it right now. And the metaverse is everywhere around us. For those who are listening, if you close your eyes right now and you open it again and say, imagine that you, the chair you're looking at, the table you're looking at, the object you're looking at has an additional data layer that you can access and purposefully be part of that layer. That's what's missing. This is what helps the humankind access the new dimension. And then within this layer, you have utilities of non-fungible token, which is a supply and demand of this new digital asset that you then can cooperate, that you can co-create, that you can own, that you can sell, right? And it becomes basically a gamified, not the game, a gamified, right, way of you interacting and, and having more depth understanding of products, of places that you're curious and so on, right? That's basically a demystification of what the metaverse is. And then I let Dennis into the point, because of that, what is the metaverse actually, right? So how can we look at this so the other day 
there's only 2 million people looking and using NFTs, 2 to 3 million people. And as you know, it crashed quite significantly in the last couple of months. And there's all the hype, which is normal on these new technologies. So let's look at, uh, and this is one of the areas that uh, you highlight in, the, in, the, in your book quite significant, is why should business care about the metaverse economy? We are, this is a YouTube podcast series about tech and business. So let's look at this answer and this mystifying as well, because of course there's, like you said, method right now as a huge part of the, the narrative. And then there's the crypto narrative, but in the end of the day, there's thousands of applications when it comes to web three and the metaverse. Yeah, web, the, the, the answer is super simple and tangible for everybody here. Um, the, the web, web, what we call web two, right, has reached its limits. Okay. Um, what I mean with that is, by the way, let's double click on web two. Tommaso, what are the pillars that define web two? Web two is defined by a social network. The web two is defined by uh, what is interconnected with social network, which is the online ads business, right? Web two is defined by e-commerce solution. And what do I mean with has reached its limits? The two dimensional world in which we are, have been living in the last 20, 20 years, right? 20 something years, right? Has been a very pleasant one. We could go on websites, we could go on e-commerce and we got information or we could buy something, right? But now the human being is no longer interested in having two dimensional transactional experiences. What they want is immersive experiences. And we see huge trends in augmented reality, virtual reality, where you, what I call immersive worlds, right? By, for instance, the market by 2030, uh, in terms of augmented reality and virtual reality, will hit 440 billion. Okay? Or the market in NFTs by 2030 so hitting 210 million, uh, billion, right? So, what it, the indications are clear. One thing is going down. Things like Facebook, TikTok, uh, uh, Twitter, and Instagram, only Twitter, uh, TikTok has still a, a consumer engagement, right? And because these main, brand, uh, main, main uh, consumer engagement platforms are going down in its engagement, people are no longer buying ads on it, or the, the, there is a decline uh, of, of ads investment in terms of revenue. And you see this in the most recent financial uh, financial calling that uh, Facebook had, which for the first time they had uh, they had a loss in terms of what they do in so that's a very obvious thing so in one hand you have a problem on the other hand you have trends and the trend is again immersive uh, immersive now what can you do in immersiveness let me break down the word immersiveness right immersiveness is when you as a human being are part of something rather than you looking at something okay so i give you one more example immersiveness is when all our senses how you look how you feel how you touch things are activated. You are part of that very specific content that is all around you because it's part of where, where what you're looking at or what you're experiencing. What it does to you is that you are way more involved with it. You are more you are more engaged. Your attention span is way more dedicated to immersiveness. So immersiveness is fundamental to the world of of metaverse. And by the way. I would like to separate here two topics that are always brought together. People say AR slash VR. And I say, wait a second, there is huge difference, right? You cannot say AR slash VR. VR, you are with a headset in front of a desk. So it's a different purpose, right? I'm not discriminating VR, but in order for VR to pick up, it's very specific segments that are actually successful, right? Which I also enjoy, such as, you know, language learning and so on. I'm part of the Immerse.online company, which you guys should take a look at. Really genius, it's VR. But in order to have mass adoption, it's not going to be VR. In order to have mass adoption, we need to live our life with our mobile phones and live on with devices that we are going to have, smart devices that we're going to have, and then get access to something that we don't have today. So the metaverse that I envision, the metaverse that I see that is getting to mass adoption is going to be with you, human being, all the time. Because you are in the metaverse right now where you use your device to access it wherever you are. So you are not joining something. You just use the metaverse, the access to the digital world and the Web3 benefits, right? Now, once you are in this augmented reality world, in this, in this access world, right? What is it you can do there? You socialize, you buy, you shop, you learn, 
right? And these are things that you can do that are more rewarding than this. When I say rewarding, right, is that whatever we are going to do in the future, we no longer are going to contribute to a third party monopolist that collects the data. Again, whatever we are going to do to shop, to socialize, to learn, we will be rewarded because the underlying technology will allow us, the human being, the end user, to get rewarded. So I'm going to learn in an immersive world and I get rewarded. I'm going to shop in an immersive world and I'm going to get rewarded. I'm going to, uh, uh, you got my picture, right? So are we prepared for this metaverse economy and what it takes to build this metaverse economy? Because there's all these stages and like the beginning of the internet, it took actually 20 years to get where we are right now. And there's still a huge part of the world population that is still struggling to get the advantage of the, the internet. And of course, this is much, much more revolutionary, like you said, because this is immersive. It touches all our senses. It touches all our sense of data and sense of belonging, even our nature and our narratives. Yeah, absolutely. It's 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 not a technology innovation. It's really a behavioral change that is happening, right? And you said it correctly, Dennis, right? Um, every innovation cycle needs decades before it gets to a maturity level, right? Let's me actually talk about maturity level, right? Um, and I want to, you know, I like always to to use anecdote because I think human humankind since the ancestors always um, uh, thought and learned in storytelling, right? Uh, if you have a baby, right, you, the baby, you, you need to have certain baby expectations to a baby, right? You cannot expect from a baby that it run, that it communicates, right? Because the baby is dependent from you. You are in charge of contributing to the baby to give them values and to guide the baby. But you know that in a couple of years, this baby will be running, will be head of a company, will be changing the world. You know that it's a human being. You know that soon it will be independent, right? So we need to stop thinking of the metaverse and having this huge expectation of the metaverse who is not right now what it should be. No, the metaverse is a baby. And we need this baby because Web2 has reached its limits. And I already shared it, right? So it's at early infancy. Actually, you should be reflecting in the opposite. You say, how can I contribute and be part of this early inception, right? And become a co-creator of the so beautiful world Web3 by assessing all risks that we always have, right? But the biggest risk always, Dennis, is not to do anything and to just judge what everything is new, which, by the way, has it happened in any cycle ever, ever, right? Since uh, since the inception of, uh, you know, mechanics, right? Remember when horses were on the streets, right? Who wanted to have cars? Why cars? I'm, I'm super happy with my horse, right? Then you have cars and say, now I need, you know, uh, electric cars, right? And then electric cars will be... Happy. So humankind is simply wired in a way that we would like to stay to what we know, right? Because that's how we think. We say, okay, this is what I know. I'm confident with that. And so called, you know, the, the famous uh, comfort zone, right? So if you stay in your comfort zone, you're not maybe making advancements, right? But then technology advancement are solving other needs that we have, especially that the new generation is having, right? In order for us not to be left behind, we should be double clicking on this topic and definitely be part and contribute towards the metaverse topic. So... While we navigate the metaverse and the picking your book, um, this is partly and in, in big part a guide to businesses. So you are teaching in the leading universities in the world, advising some of these. So people listening to us, and I always like to take a very clear matrix and as well understanding how we can use this. Because I think the challenge right now, for instance, I did a, a guest lecture actually this week in a business school. And the students were, oh, my, there's all these problems of the negativity, psychology, dystopian, all these different things. But in the end of the day, this is a multi-trillion dollars business. And we're talking right now about 2030, $30 trillion, 15 to $30 trillion, 15 GP Morgan. Um, actually, AI lights, but it will be probably much bigger. So how can this metaverse be a guide to businesses? And how can we guide business into the metaverse? Let's put it that way. And how can we as well take this kind of negativity that exists around the concept 
a lot to unpack in in this question. Well, yes. Actually, let let me actually uh, uh, go to the maybe to the to the historical part of why do we get here so that companies see themselves in each phase, and then I discuss what do we do in this phase, right? So in phase Web one, okay, called Web one. What we what companies uh, did is to respond and to solve a need. Companies always solve a need, okay. And what was the need? Well, we had the yellow pages, we had books, okay, we had the uh, offline advertisement, and uh, this new thing came up called the digital www is then become internet, right? And said, okay, why don't we put our information online? Do you think that they will go from offline and, and and books and yellow pages right i mean i started my company at yellow pages times so, you know i know what it means looking into yellow pages right to call uh, a specific so so then the internet came and so people were finding information uh, on on two websites this matured dennis into the next and this was basically then 20 years into it into a new technology advancements because more people were searching online uh, the search engine come on the market and say, why do we have them a search, them the end user, them the customer search, if we can provide proactively at their palm of their hands, okay, push notifications. So, and what was born was the entire social media world, okay, which, which came together with the mobile phones and with online advertisements. So, so the human being went from web one www visit our website to web2 follow us on instagram follow us on so following means that you reactively are just there and you get something right so the more you were getting push notification the more people were scrolling on their phones the more we get annoyed dennis because i mean now we are just have a habit of going through information but we don't capture information again we go through information but we don't capture information so we are at the point where we are overwhelmed with information that is no longer impacting the attention span of the humankind. That's the reason why it needs this new world, which is then Web3. What is Web3? Starting with uh, now, the year 2021, actually, companies are going to have immersive worlds. And why immersive? And I have explained it throughout the podcast because it captures your attention. You cannot swipe through an immersiveness. You need to be there. So the attention span that we all are fighting for, because at the end of the day, that's what entrepreneurs do. We fight for attention span, right? So that's basically right there in this immersiveness, right? And you are immersive into a world in which you get rewarded. So let me repeat. Web 1, visit our website. Web 2, follow us on. And Web 3, experience us in okay and the experience is we are going to have experiences the question now is dennis that asked me dennis asked me is now well how how to metaverse how do companies metaverse well the objective is experiences your goal dear corporation is to build experiences. The question is where to build experiences, how to build experiences. In my book, I describe a framework which is called the ASAP framework, right? Which is basically a four-step framework in which you as a corporation have an approach on how to get into the metaverse. But by the way, for those who are also interested, I'm chair at almameta.xyc where I have a seven hours course, seven hours, okay? Uh, so, of course, where I guide corporations, non-technical professionals to um, get into uh, the metaverse with a risk assessment, metaverse types, experience type. But here for the purpose of this meeting, and we have a couple of minutes left, right? Let me break down what you should be, um, uh, how you would sh should be thinking about this ASAP framework. Number one, you should be reverse engineering your goal. What is your goal? The goal is for you to connect your physical product with the digital world. That's the goal. Why? Because we have an existing business and you want to interwine your existing business as much as possible with the Web3 opportunities. What are the Web3 opportunities? Immersiveness and rewarding system. Okay. So this is the metaverse market called digital. Digital is the combination of physical and digital. 30 to 40% 30 
of the overall 1.3 trillion metaverse market by 2030, 30 to 40 percent of it will be digital because if we're solving industry's problem by connecting the physical and the digital world, it will be the majority of the entire metaverse market or a great, a great majority, a great part will be the digital. So you want to get there. And then the question is, well, Tommaso, if this is my goal, how do I start? Well, you need to start by experimenting. Or let me be very provoc uh, provocative. You need to um, avoid, I was about to say stop, I didn't say it, avoid, start to understanding innovation on paper. You can just read as many articles and books as you want. You need to get your, wet, your feet wet. And you start out by doing things on existing environments. You go to existing platforms, such as if you want to do decentralized or, or centralized, I actually um, uh, uh, suggest uh, the centralized because you're solving more the needs of the next uh, generation. And you start, you know, on Somnium space, you start on Decentraland, on Sandbox, without you having expectation in phase number one to drive revenues. Because you are experimenting. The goal of experimentation is learning of a target audience. It's not driving. A so if you start, Start now, experiment, you will learn so much that within the next 12 to 18 months, you will have such an understanding, not a theoretical, a practical understanding, that you will be on top of the game compared to the others that will be basically joining later, right? And so then again, you work towards, from that part of experimentation towards the physical to digital integration. Fantastic. And I, I, I think we, it's the most important thing. So last part, because we have five minutes, literally. So. One of your books previously was Grow Fact Your Startup, How Creative Traction Methodology Gets Innovation Traction. You partly touched that in this answer, but I, I would like to go because especially for the metaverse and anything in business, uh, creative traction methodology is a very important one. So I would like for you in the next five minutes, I think is what we have, for highlighting this as a wrap up of this and probably I'll, I'll, I'll challenge for a second take of this interview. Um... Yeah, um, my first book, Creative Traction Methodology, solving the following uh, problem, right? When, when you are an entrepreneur and you are in an early stage phase um, of, of, of your company, what we all have is one huge objective and limited resources, limited time, limited money, limited people, right? Uh, and so the question is, do you give up? or are you becoming creative and agile on what you do, right? And, and creative traction methodology is a framework of three pillars that allows any uh, actually um, entrepreneur to make the maximum with the minimum effort. It's actually a shortcut, if you so want, right? On leveraging the minimum resource that you have and bring and have a maximum outcome. Obviously, the outcome should lead you potentially to a next phase, right? And uh, one of the core things, and again, this book is very much tied and leans into technology, right? Is you start out by having a clear value proposition for what problem are you solving for what target audience? And even though this might be kind of common sense, still, uh, the thousands of startups that I advise per year, by the way, right, um, have still the same issue on finding a very clear value proposition. And again, this is just a high level saying value proposition. But if you go into the book, you will be seeing here an entire list on how you actually phrase and, 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 and write copies and assess in a framework and how you get there, right? Then the second part is that you are starting basically to A-B test markets, right? Because you don't know what markets are going. And the A-B testing is all about quality and quantity. So in this book, you will be having 400 tools that I've been assessing over the last, uh, last actually almost eight, nine years, right? And, uh, and, and these tools allow you with minimal resources, achieve a maximum, uh, a maximum impact, right? And that's kind of the process that the, that the book uh, uh, describes, uh, uh, Dennis, right? Uh, ultimately, you know, the, 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 the recap is you need to shift your mindset to start executing, testing, validating with agile tools, right? And you make this a, a, a behavioral shift rather than you fearing um, not to contact people on the market, not to get in touch with too many people on the market, right? And that's what usually happens when startups fail. 
Well, thank you. I know that we I try to respect your time, and I think this is very inspiring, very to the point. And I think I would suggest people listen to us, buy the book, engage. It's one of the books that I'm reading and highlighting. But as well, uh, I think there's a lot of uh, wisdom in what uh, Tomaso has. Uh, we're going to put the links to the social networks of Tomaso. Um, there's a lot of things from TomasoDiBartolo.com to a lot of other areas. And um, thank you so much for having us, uh, for inspiring us here, Tomaso. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me, Dennis. Thank you so much. Keep it up.